six over voltage protection boxes, six CBC combiners and associated cables with companies existing personal wireless service facility or BWSF located on the rooftop of Mary Donovan Hall on the Cornell University campus. The proposal is considered a modification of the existing PWSF. The city recently amended Article 5A, Telecommunications Facilities and Services of the Zoning Ordinance, and the amendment requires all PWSF to be located at least 250 feet from adjacent residences. The existing PWSF at this site is located on the rooftop of a residential building. This is an existing deficiency that will not be exacerbated by this proposal. 115 North Cross Road is located in the U1 district in which proposed installation is permitted. However, sections 325.29.6 and 325.29.16 require compliance with Article 5A, including the location requirements set forth in section 325.29.8 before a building permit may be issued. Section 325.29.28 authorizes the Board of Zoning Appeals to grant variance from any provision of Article 5A. We have Tim and Bob here for this appeal. So the appellant, uh, when ready, please take five minutes to present your case. Is there anything that you would like to add or state to the appeal beyond what you've already provided? Uh, good evening, Robert Bergdorf for the law firm Nixon Peabody here tonight on behalf of Verizon Wireless. Um, the review of the project that was uh, just made, I think captures it well. It is an existing facility providing services as a mere antenna change. Um, it will have no discernible effect uh, or change really um, with respect to zoning. Uh, uh, because of this proposal. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. I will now open it up to questions from the board to the appellant. Is there anybody that would like to chime in? No questions? Okay. okay. No questions. Uh, I have no questions either. I will now open it up to public hearing. Is anyone here to speak in favor or against? We do not have anyone signed up to speak this evening, either in support or opposition, and we have not received any written comments. We do have the planning board's recommendation, um, which states, as this is an existing nonconformity and an update not causing visual impact, the planning board finds no long-term negative impacts to planning. Thank you. That, and we can close the public hearing, and then we will move on to board deliberation. Comments, Mike? This seems pretty routine. I don't have any comments. Okay. Joe? Likewise, it's simply a modification, so. Okay. Same as the other members. And I concur. I think with that, is there a motion to? I'll make a motion. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the board acknowledged this is an existing installation and the modification will not exacerbate the existing deficiency. Um, factors considered whether there's an undesirable change would be produced in the character of the neighborhood or the detriment of the nearby properties. Uh, no, the installation is a modification of an existing personal wireless facility that has been located on the rooftop of the property for many years. The new installation will replace existing equipment. There's no evidence this change will produce an undesirable change to neighborhood character. Whether the benefits sought by the applicant can be achieved by a feasible alternative to the variance, no. The locations of personal wireless service facilities are determined by service coverage requirements. While there's a limited radius where the PWSF can be located, it is preferred as stated in the zoning ordinance to locate co-locate equipment on existing sites whenever possible to limit any visual impacts. Furthermore, any alternate location within the limited radius of this property will also be deficient in the resident setback requirements of the zoning ordinance. Whether the requested variance is substantial, no, the proposed 
installation will be located on a roof of a residential structure and a residential setback of 250 feet is required by the zoning ordinance. While this is 100% deficiency of the required setback, this is a deficiency caused by the location of the existing facility on which the new antenna array will be co-located and will not be exacerbated by the proposal. Do the variants have an adverse effect on the physical or environmental conditions in the neighborhood? No. Uh, the equipment will be part of an existing installation on the property. And whether the alleged difficulty was self-created? No. The applicant is proposing to install the new equipment at an existing PWSF location to mitigate visual clutter. And I so move. <laughs> Uh, is there a second? I'll okay. second. Okay. Uh, Ms. Wilson, could you please provide board members? Mr. Cannon. Yes. Mr. Carter? Yes. Mr. Kirby? Yes. And Mr. Merkin? Yes. Great. Right, so the variance has been approved. Um, you will get a written decision from the board within the next couple of days, and we'll communicate this with. Um, the building division as well, so they'll be able to go ahead and issue your permit. Um, if you have any questions for me afterwards, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. And that brings us to appeal number 3230. And this is appeal of um, appeal number 3230 for 222 South Hugo Street. Appeal of T-Mobile Northeast LLC and Centerline Communications LLC the property owner David Hart for an area variance from section 325.29.8C1 design standards for personal wireless service facilities of the city of Ithaca zoning ordinance. The applicant proposes to replace three existing antennas, install additional equipment to the company's existing personal wireless service facility, PWSF, located on the rooftop of the property at 222 South Cuba Street. The proposal is considered a modification of the existing PWSF. The city recently amended Article 5A, Telecommunications and Facilities, and the amendment requires all PWSF to be located at least 250 feet from adjacent residences. The existing installation of this property is approximately 170 feet from the nearest residential building. This is an existing deficiency that will not be exacerbated by this proposal. And I've read the remaining information in the summary about the relevant code sections. So I believe we have um, Bryce McCullough here for this appeal. Yeah, so we're just asking for the uh, approval of the variance. Um, this is just for an update in an existing facility. Modification is not going to change the appearance of the existing structure or property. Um, once again, this is just an equipment upgrade. Okay, anything else you'd like to add? Nope, that's uh, all I have. Okay. Uh, like the one before, we're going to open this up to uh, questions from the board. Is there anything from board members? No questions. No questions. No. Uh, and that brings us to public hearing. Right. We do not have any written comments or anyone signed up to speak, either in favor or in opposition to the appeal. I do have a comment from the planning board, which states as this is an existing non-conformity and an update not causing visual impact, the planning board finds no long-term negative impacts to planning. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll close the public hearing and uh, we will open this up to board deliberation. Pretty much same as the last one. It's a modification. I think it's pretty routine. I agree. Same as the other one. Right, I'm in agreement. Um, it's a modification to an existing. Uh, is there somebody that would like to make a motion? Uh, Andre, after you. <laughs> I'll make a motion. Uh, I motion to grant a variance requested. I motion to grant a variance for appeal number 3230. Um, so the board acknowledges that this is an existing facility and the modification will not exacerbate the existing facility. 
factors to consider. One, whether an undesirable change will be produced in the character of the neighborhood or a detriment to nearby properties. No, the proposed installation is a modification of an existing facility that has been on that property for 20 years. The new installation will replace existing, and there's no evidence that the change will result in an undesirable change to the neighborhood. Two, whether the benefit by, sought by the applicant can be, can be achieved by a feasible alternative. Uh, no, the locations of uh, these facilities are determined by service coverage requirements. While there is a limited radius where the facility can be located, heard as stated in the zoning ordinance to co-locate equipment on existing sites whenever possible to limit any visual impact. Furthermore, any alternate location within the limited radius of this sub property would also have the same position. Uh, three, whether the requested variance is substantial. No, the proposed installation will be located 120 feet from the nearest residential structure and a reg residential setback of 250 feet is required by the zoning and our audience. While this is a deficiency of 32% of the required setback, this is a deficiency caused by the location of an existing facility site on which the new antenna array will be located and will not exacerbate any deficiency. Or would the variance have an adverse impact on the physical or environmental conditions of the neighborhood? No, the facility equipment will be part of an existing installation on the property. There's no evidence to indicate that the alteration will have any adverse impact. Five, whether or not the difficulty is upgraded. No, the applicant is proposing to install new equipment on an existing facility uh, to mitigate uh, visual clutter as requested by the city. The residential setback deficiency is an existing deficiency and predates the city's adoption of the residential setback requirement. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. I think you did call. Mr. Cannon? Yes. Mr. Gardner? Yes. Mr. Kirby? Yes. And Mr. Barkin? Yes. <clears throat> All right, so um, the variance has been approved. You will be receiving the written um, decision within the next few days by email, and it'll also be sent to the building division to move forward with your building permit. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, that brings us to appeal number three, oh. two. Oh. Okay, we will take a five minute bathroom break. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> <Gosh. laughs> Laura, can you hear us okay? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Thank Is you. Scott from my team also in that call? Um, I think he should be joining just now. Okay. I'm excited. Okay. Uh, so whenever you're ready, uh, if you could um, just present a you know, summary to the, to the board. This is a continuation, okay. so we saw you last time. Um, Again, just a, a recap and summary. Um, can you see my screen? Uh, okay. Uh, so, when you're ready, uh, you can. Uh, Laura, do you have your YouTube on? Um, no. This is a I can hear you, Scott. Yeah. Hello. Are you ready for us to start? Like, for the end some sound issue? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'm uh, Scott Sealand. Um, we're still trying to figure out. We're getting an echo of you speaking, so we'll try to figure that out. Just one second. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do either of you have your YouTube feed playing? Yeah. Oh. 
are you ready for us to start? Yeah. Lydia and some sound. I don't have I'm Scott I don't have my YouTube. Megan, you're muted if you're speaking with me. Can you hear me now? Yes. The problem we were having was with Scott's iPad. So we had to, uh, uh, by process of elimination, have him step out in the room for a minute. I don't know if he has another way to join, um, but it was causing a lot of repeat sound play. Megan, you're muted if you're speaking with me. Can you hear me now? Yes. The problem we're having was with Scott's iPad. So we had a uh, uh, process of elimination having to step out in the room for a minute. I don't know if he has another way to join, um, but it was causing a lot of repeat sound play in here. So we make sure that he's making. Okay, so let's see. Let me try that. All right, Laura, we're going to try this again. Can you hear now? Yes. All right, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what happened, but we have to kind of reboot here. Okay. Um, not at first, it's, it wasn't. <laughs> is Scott back? Just wait one second. We'll get him in here. Fingers crossed. Okay. Hi, Scott. Sorry about that. Oh, but you're muted. Scott, you're muted. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. When I uh, when you kicked me out, I accidentally joined the uh, planning board meeting tomorrow night. Uh, so, or tried to. Um, okay, so, you know, I'm Scott Seal from CGS Architects. 
um, here for 132 Cherry Street um, for VISM development. Um, you know, we do have this presentation. It is, you know, this really the same material that we looked at last month. Um, you know, so maybe it's it's more for, you know, if you have questions or whatnot. Um, you know, we are here seeking a front yard variance. Um, you know, this is the Cherry Street District. The um, regulation is um, 15 feet from the inside edge of sidewalk. And, you know, what we're requesting is that it uh, 20 feet from the property line at the first floor and then 15 feet from the property line at the floors above. Um, and, and, you know, this is really to comply with the, um, you know, the fire code of the state of New York requirements for a aerial access fire road for uh, any building over 30 feet. Um, so that's basically it. You know, if you have any more questions. Uh, you know, and I am sharing my screen. My Are you adding anything, Laura? No, I just wanted to confirm that you guys are seeing my screen. Yes. yes. Okay. And then just to confirm, there's been no changes from last month. Is that correct? We no, we haven't submitted any changes. The only change to the project is that we have um, reduced the size of the south building. Um, by approximately nine feet off that north end. So we were losing two parking spots on the ground floor and then some square footage on the apartments above. And again, that's actually also to comply with the uh, fire code of New York State aerial access fire road requirements just to make that courtyard a little wider. Um, and we'll be discussing that at the planning board meeting tomorrow. But as far as the variance request, as, sure as far as the variance request, no, nothing, nothing has changed. Uh, are there any remaining questions from board members since last month? No. All right, and then uh, tonight's a continuation of public hearing. Uh, we opened it last month. Uh, so, with that, are there any new public comments or planning board comments? We do not have any new public comments. We do have a recommendation from the planning board. Um, the planning board fully supports this variance as this development is in a location where the city is encouraging development and the applicant is willingly working with the city to create a favorable streetscape along Cherry Street. As such, the proposed sidewalk is located on the project site, further narrowing the property. Without this variance, given the property dimensions, it would prove difficult to develop. Um, and I will also note that the planning board did complete environmental review for this project um, at their August meeting um, and has declared that there is no significant impact on the environment. Thank you. Uh, with that, we can now close public comment and we'll open this up to uh, board deliberation. So anybody with thoughts or comments to start this off? Uh, when they last presented, I was pretty happy overall with the project, um, especially considering the uh, issue with emergency vehicle access, kind of necessitating them to move forward. Um, so with that in consideration, I'm pretty happy to move forward. Thank you. Um, Andre, what about you? I think they're making the minimum ask they need to make to comply with New York State code. So I'm happy with it as I was last meeting. Mike? I agree with Andre's comment. I concur. Um, I'm comfortable with this. If no one else has other comments, um, perhaps somebody's uh, open to making a motion. I will make a motion to grant variance number 32220. Sorry, Joe, that's yep. incorrect. For appeal 3228 for uh, 132. Cherry 
want to rattle off the facts here. Yeah, I'll do the for a second. I'll do the factors considered uh, whether an undesirable change would be produced in the character of the neighborhood or a detriment to nearby mm -hmm. properties. No, the front yard in the Cherry Street district is measured from the inside edge of the sidewalk to the building facade. This is intended to provide green space between the building front and the sidewalk, which is often in the public right of way. The sidewalk at 132 Cherry Street will be located on private property, and the applicant is working with the city to create a pedestrian friendly streetscape. While the applicant is proposing a reduced front yard, the goal of creating green space and a well designed street table will still be achieved. Number two, whether the benefits sought by the applicant can be achieved by a feasible alternative to the variance? No. If the applicant cites the building to meet the front yard requirement, it is beyond the allowed range for aerial access for emergency response. It is not feasible to meet both the requirements of the zoning ordinance and New York State Fire Code. Whether the requested variance is substantial, Yes, the applicant is proposing a front yard of eight feet from the inside edge of the sidewalk. This results in a front yard deficiency of 47%. The board finds that there is no feasible alternative that would meet all applicable codes and achieve the goal for an active pedestrian friendly streetscape along Cherry Street. Again, that's the New York State Fire Code and the work that the appellant is doing to ensure a friendly streetscape. Uh, will the variance have an adverse impact on the physical or environmental conditions in the neighborhood? Uh, no, the Planning and Development Board acting as lead agency has determined that the project will not have a significant impact on the environment. Based on the submitted materials and testimony of the applicant, there is no evidence of the adverse physical or environmental impact resulting from the lot coverage deficiency. Whether the alleged difficulty was self-created, the alleged difficulty is self-created in the applicant is choosing to redevelop the property at 132 Cherry Street. However, the site conditions, however, site conditions unique to this property in the city's objectives, uh, street design make it infeasible to meet both the requirements of the zoning ordinance and New York State Fire Code. So I do move to accept this appeal. I second that motion. I didn't move to this poll. Board members, remember? Mr. Cannon? Yes. Mr. Gardner? Yes. Mr. Kirby? Yes. And Mr. Barton? Yes. All right. So the variance has been granted by the board. Um, you'll be receiving the written decision within the next few days. And I'll be sending your copy to both the planning board and the building division as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next appeal is appeal 3221. Uh, I'll be stepping out so as to avoid any appearance of a conflict. Andre Gardner will be taking over for this appeal as uh, co chair, and Marshall McCormick will be standing in uh, as a board uh, member. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank This is my first appeal that I'm sharing, so thank you all for your patience. We're just going to let Mr. Barkin step out. Good evening, Marshall. Good evening. Welcome. Is Iris there? She just joined. She okay. should be coming in. I think that's everybody. John. John. All right, so appeal three two two one um for one oh nine to one eleven Valentine Place. Appeal of Trobridge Wolf Michael Flansky Architects on behalf of property owner Valentine Place Associates LLC. For an error variance from section 325A, column four, off street parking, and column six, flat area requirements of the zoning ordinance. The applicant proposes to demolish the two existing multiple dwellings at 109 and 111 Valentine Place and construct a new four story multiple dwelling with 30 apartments. The minimum lot area requirement of the R3A district is based on the number of dwelling units provided on site. A minimum lot area of 26,250 square feet is required for a 30 unit multiple dwelling. And the property is 17,119 square feet, resulting in a deficiency of 9,131 square feet of lot area. In addition, the proposed unit configuration requires 34 off street spaces. The applicant is proposing no on site parking. The property owner will allow tenants of the new building to utilize existing off-street parking in one of the nearby College Town Terrace lots. 
The project team presented their appeal at the June 2022 BZA meetings. Meeting. Some member expressed concern about the substantiality and necessity of the requested variances. The applicants requested to table the appeal to allow time to provide additional information to address the board's questions and concerns. The applicant would like to make a brief five minute overview of the property below. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, I'm Catherine Wolf, Trevor's with Michael's Landscape Architects, uh, representing the applicant, and I'm joined here by John Novar. Uh, and Iris is uh, running a slideshow for me here remotely. Uh, so um, we have no change uh, to the project proposal. Uh, I, Megan asked me to give just a very brief recap since it's been a while since we've been here. And then I also have a, a, a brief overview of the supplemental information that we provided. Um, we went back and uh, listened to the, uh, you know, uh, reviewed the, the questions and the comments that were brought up last time. And so the applicant has submitted a letter that we feel uh, addressed uh, many of the uh, questions and uh, the line of questioning that uh, at the last uh, meeting. So uh, uh, next slide, please. So in summary, uh, the project uh, is 30 apartments, 30 apartment units with a ground floor leasing office. We are requesting two variances, uh, relief from the minimum lot size and relief from the off-street parking requirement. Next slide. The project is located in the R38 zone, and the project as designed complies with use, height, setback, and coverage regulations. The planning board has made a secret determination that the project is consistent with the community character, and there are no identified environmental impacts. The project also complies with the city's 2015 company's plan, uh, which looks for greater density in this area. Next slide. The project is located at the end of Valentine Place, adjacent to the College Town Terrace apartment uh, project uh, developed by the same developer. Next slide. This is a survey of existing conditions. You can see there is an existing uh, double house that would be demolished. There's also significant paving on site. The driveway wraps around the property. There's parking in front and in the back. Uh, if we were granted the variance, the intention is that we would eliminate all of this asphalt from the site. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, and in its place, we would actually reforest the, the south and east sides of the property, uh, which is really a continuation of the extensive landscaping at College Town Terrace. And uh, so the parking variance would allow us to have a slight increase in green space. Next slide. An elevation along uh, Valentine Place. Here you can see all of the buildings, the existing buildings to the left. Uh, and then the uh, gold colored building is the new proposal with College Town Terrace on the right. Next slide. And a view looking southeast uh, as it would appear from the street. Next slide. Uh, so this chart summarizes what the effect uh, and the difference would be between the proposal and uh, what the code would result in. And so uh, we looked at a buy right scheme and for the lot area, uh, we would be able to develop a project that had 52 beds and 15 units comprised of a three and four bedroom mix. So if we keep the same building footprint and same height as proposed by the applicant, we are able, we are proposing 48 beds in 30 units. This would be 23 studios and the balance being in three and four bedrooms. So the difference in the two projects, the one that complies with zoning and the one with the variance is that we will have four fewer beds we have 15 additional units, but it's all within the same building envelope. Uh, so there's no change to the building footprint in the exterior. There's actually no visible difference between the two projects. Uh, so that's, that's, sort of, that's the net effect of the variance of the lottery. Uh, for parking, 
Uh, all street parking, three, four spaces uh, are required by the zoning. Uh, we've outlined the transportation demand management strategies uh, that uh, exist uh, and are being proposed for the project. Uh, I think, you know, first and foremost is the fact that increasingly students are bringing fewer cars to campus. So we don't believe there is anywhere near the demand for 34 spaces that is required by zoning. Um, and this is consistent throughout all of the properties that the applicant owns uh, this trend and we hear it from other developers as well. So first of all, we believe that demand is much less. Uh, in addition, it's the site is very walkable to campus, to college town. Uh, there are uh, TCAT uh, bus stops nearby as well as car share. And the uh, applicant operates a shuttle uh, from College Town Terrace, which will also service uh, this project. Therefore, uh, the uh, and, and, and then in addition, the applicant uh, would uh, propose to allow parking for anybody who needs it at the adjacent College Town Terrace that has many unused spaces. Um, and the result would be that we have increased green space uh, on site and we wouldn't have to uh, pay for the parking. Um, so next slide, please. So that just sort of summarizes the, the difference between the proposal and the variance, or excuse me, and the as of right. Uh, so now just to summarize the supplemental information that we provided. Um, so really what's, what's driving this request is the market demand, the market demand for studio apartments. This is a trend that has been happening for a number of years. Uh, increasingly, there is a demand for more studio apartments. Uh, the applicant's target market, market is grad students, and they overwhelmingly prefer studios. Development in College Town historically has focused on multi-bedroom units. And we outlined uh, this, this is outlined in the letter that John submitted, but it was actually even surprising to us um, how few studios there are. I mean, we did an informal survey um, and there, there are very few studio apartments in many of these major apartment complexes in College Town. Uh, and that's that's outlined in the letter. So there is a there's a resulting gap in the market for studio apartments. I mean, I think over years and, and years, these multi-bedroom apartment buildings have been built and now the you know just really high demand for studios and there's a gap in the market. The applicant's own inventory is heavily weighted to two and three bedroom units. Only 10% of the College Town Terrace beds are in studios. Uh, and so they're currently unable to offer what potential tenants are looking for. Uh, a substantial number of the applicants own three bedroom and larger units are currently unrented. Uh, a couple of their projects in College Town, um, there are uh, one of the properties uh, there at 301 College Avenue, uh, approximately 30% of the units are unrented. They're all three bedroom or larger. Um, 312 College Avenue, um, uh, more than a third of the three bedroom or larger units uh, are not rented. And so they're trying other strategies, you know, rent them by the bedroom, try to rent it as a two bedroom with very little success. Also, uh, oh, John. Uh, the buildings that she just the buildings that she just mentioned in college now, interestingly, have had no issues with studios ones and twos. It's all in the larger units. So common sense would tell you we're not real interested in exacerbating, exacerbating what we always already have as a problem in C town. Next slide. Final slide. Next slide, Iris, please. Oh. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, you know, um, and they continue to receive you know, daily inquiries for studios or one bedrooms. They, you know, have insufficient inventory to meet the market demand. And so, um, obviously, the intention here is to meet market demand. Um, it's just, they have plenty of three and four bedrooms. They're not able to. You know, so why do they want to build more of them, right? And the intention is to meet the market demand. 
Um, so I hope that gives you a better understanding of what the market is and what uh, the, the, the rationale behind the variance. Um, related to the parking, I think we've already covered most of this. I guess that we just uh, point out that the adjacent College Town Terrace parking garage, uh, that, you know, they're also, they have this overall trending of lower auto use. And so we actually just, um, you know, up until very recently, of course, people are still renting spaces for the semester because we're, uh, but now that we're almost October, um, you know, we think things are pretty settled in for the year. So we checked in to see what the, um, what the rental rates are as of last week. And as of last week, so, so the garage has 656 spaces, uh, 350, or maybe 354, or excuse me. 290. No, 600, is the garage has 600 yeah. and um, 49 spaces, I think it's a total. Yeah. And there are 356 spaces unrented. So, um, um, and so it just, it seems it's immediately next door. I mean, to build the parking just um, doesn't feel like an environmentally um, reasonable thing to do. And so that concludes our presentation and we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, why don't we go around and make, do you have any questions for the applicants? Can I just, is Tom on your team? Tom Hamilton, is that? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Um, so the existing, the, the proposal you're giving us is half studio apartments and half two and three bedroom apartments? Uh, no. Um, or one? It's, it's, so it's 30 units total. Of those 30 units, 23 are studios. Okay, and seven. Okay. Seven are three or four bedroom. Okay, good. Mr. Kirby, do you have any questions? I do. As it relates to parking, I understand obviously the initial focus that everybody looks at is cars and the amount of cars. But as it relates to population density, can you talk to me about that a little bit and the uh, use of parking to stymie increased population densities and how saying no parking here is necessary, um, no parking spaces here necessary, and so we can, we can fill it up without any need for the on site parking. Well, I think that um, we have 40. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you just said. I'm sorry. That's fine. What I'm getting at is a lot of times parking spaces and the requirement of these on site parking spaces is to con kind of kind of control uh, population density within the area. Um, I understand you guys are coming in, I think, four occupants shy of that. But as then totally absolving yourself of the need for any on site parking, and then other people being able to likewise come in and argue, well, we gave you 34 spaces that you did not need, we gave the variance for that. How do you speak to the concerns about increasing population density, kind of subverting that requirement? I'm not I don't sure really know quite... how to respond to that. I'm not sure. It's... I'm sorry, I don't quite question either. Um, we, we have twice the number of parking places, give or take, Bob's view, that we can possibly rent. I, I can't figure out why we would want to build more parking. That's really what well, it comes down to. You know, I, I guess I would, but you know, even that aside, okay, even that aside, 34 spaces are required by zoning. If we look at the likely demand, if we look at proportionately what other properties like uh, are um, the number of tenants who are bringing cars, um, we think the demand could be eight approximately. Um, so that would be, and, and so, you know, with, with all of the transportation demand management opportunities that is afforded this site, um, the walkability, uh, we think that all the, the, the trend of people bringing fewer and fewer cars, we just think all of these things combined to create a very low demand. 
And so I don't know exactly how that answers your question about population density, but I think that, I mean, I think you're hearing from other developers too, that the, the uh, demand for parking is much less. Um, I think that's, it's, we're not the only uh, developer that is having that experience. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, frankly, I think the, um, so the, the zoning is outdated. The parking requirement is outdated to require them to build a parking garage for 650 spaces and it's being half occupied. I mean, that's not a, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it, it's neither here nor there for this project, but, uh, if, you know, to, to kind of, if, you know, you're asking a question about how does this impact um, density? Um, well, when, when we used to rent in the, with the old projects that we had in Valentine uh, with hundreds of bedrooms, we used to have our parking was was one car for every two students. And we are half of that today. The zoning, I don't believe, has changed during that time. It, it could be said that once upon a time, the zoning made pretty good sense. And, I mean, this is not your problem, but we're left dealing with it. And 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 so I mean, what, what I can tell you is there's no need for more blacktop and more parking. And so the question for us uh, in front of you guys and the planning board and all is how do you present this thing in such a way that we're not creating a problem in the neighborhood? Um, and um, the best thing that could happen is that we rent all the parking. We absorb we absorb cars from all over the place and get them off the streets. Uh, it's silly to have them down there and half empty. You know, I, otherwise, I, I don't know whether I, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm helping you out. But <laughs> it's always asking? good information. I think I was asking an inartful question, but I think the gist of what I was looking for, I mean, to a certain extent, again, the parking requirements do in some way, shape, and form act to stymie the amount of people that can be put on a given property. If you need fewer parking spaces, you do that by reducing the amount. So that's what I'm saying more so is when we're absolving that, like that's that's what I was looking at. But what you guys have provided, I think we've, we've belabored this point. Uh, do you have any more questions? No. no. Uh -huh. I, have a kind of question. I, I don't know the Cornell apartment situation, but if I'm a grad student and I bring a car to College Town Terrace and I drive it over to campus, where are they making me park? Right, further away than College Town <laughs> Terrace. I mean, <laughs> everything <laughs> has conspired to discourage the growth of cars. Right. So we, I, I see what you're saying. You know, we're, we're in some ways we're managing growth by having the parking requirement. I don't have a problem here, and I've um, you, I heard these claims a year ago, and I was shocked. And I've driven through your parking garages, and it's you know they're empty. <laughs> yeah, so I don't want you to build parking as anything else. And actually, oddly enough, to address what you were talking about, they're empty because we were solving a, a supposed problem that you identified. If, if the city indeed was trying to regulate the number of units that you can build by the number of parking places you had to have, the net result of Terrace is, is that we ended up meeting code with 645 parking places and half of them are empty. So there's kind of something wrong with the picture. I do, like I do very much get yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. I honestly tend to agree about the parking spot whole issue. Our hands are a bit tied where I don't get to make the laws or the zoning ordinances or anything like that. We have to still apply each case to each appeal to what that's, those That's are. why we're here tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. McCormick, do you have any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify the, um, the number, it says 23 studios. Yes, Iris, could you go to that chart Yeah, that shows that please? Thank you. Right, so the proposal is, you can see there, um, 48 beds, 
uh, 23 studios, and then there are seven units that are three and four bedrooms. Something mix, maybe three. I don't know the exact count of that. So that that was my original. My original question was, why are you building more than three for <laughs> It's always good to have a selection in any building. And so, uh, and, and at some point, uh, perhaps the ask is even in our own minds a little more than we think some people can digest. I don't know. I mean, this is all a hit and miss. We we don't know right to the to the unit or the bedroom what's rentable and what isn't. What we do know is that we run out of studio apartments at College Town Terrace ahead of every other unit every year. And there's a message in there. And the threes uh, get rented, as I pointed out, at Terrace, but with difficulty. And in College Town, we've got, a, we've got empties in, in buildings that in 15 and 20 years, we never had a vacancy. I'd like to follow up on that because this was a question. I think I know the answer. I think I can guess the answer. But how feasible would it be to convert some of those empty three bedroom units in those other buildings into studio apartments? Well, we went in a different direction. We rebuilt all the bathrooms and kitchens. You know, I mean, your insight is right. We just went at it a little differently. Spent a couple of million bucks in the last year and a half. And they're still empty. Yeah. When, when in their former crummy stage, twenty-year-old bathrooms and kitchens, they ran it. Yeah. So. So I have a few questions. So a few questions for you. Um, my understanding is there's a green space requirement for R three A. If you build parking on site, how many parking spaces could you build? Let's say we said. Blacktop everything, what could you provide? It seems like such an absurd. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think we looked at it that hard, but I mean, could we somehow can reconfigure things and find well, this, 20 spots? That whole back piece could be, uh, that whole back could be a, a parking lot. Um, you could have a driveway, you know, you could have a driveway went that went back there and the whole back could be a parking lot. So that just guess. Yes. Um, well, the coverage of a lot is well known. 70,000 square feet. It is. It is. It is. Uh, well, to meet the right. So the question is, does that fit here? I think the answer doesn't. But I'm just wondering how yeah. short it would be if you tried. Yeah, I'm trying to scale drawing in front of me. I'm really sorry. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to do that calculation. It's fine. Um, so. When I think about the area variance page, if you sort of had to convert this into a formula to some extent, like you're basically suggesting this is how much code you can do by right. And then you're converting that into a bedrooms and then converting it over into units while staying within the confines of all the other code requirements. Is that right. essentially your formula? Okay. Okay. So I believe Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have, oh, does the board have any other questions? So I believe that we have done a public hearing previously, so we do not need to go forward with one. So we're gonna move into board deliberations. I wanna go around the room again. Mike, what are your thoughts? I didn't have any problems the last time and I don't have any problems this time. Joe? The area variants are not as worried about mostly because they're keeping less people based on what their plan is for the actual building. I'm still, I, I was not super pleased with the um, parking plan, the amount of the deficiency, just 34 to zero. I understand the mitigation and everything else going on. 
I'm still hemming and hawing about that. Marshall? I didn't have any issue with it before. Um, I have even less of an issue with it now. Um, when I think about the Austria parking, they're required to have 34 spaces. Isn't a calculation that requires one spot per person in every studio? But if you were to reconfigure those studios to be four bedrooms, you'd have you'd be required half as many spaces at most. Because a four bedroom unit only requires two spaces. So only half the people that live in four bedroom units bring cars, but all of the people that live in studios bring cars. I don't think it makes any sense. I think the argument could be made that um, that while the variance appears to be 34, if they were to build it by right, the amount of parking that would need to be required would be less. And so in some ways you could think of it as a sort of a lower reach than the full 34 units that are not being provided. I think that in this case, we have a code that is uh, for this for this location, for this era, for this proposal, uh, very poorly written and not very well thought out, and that this is the board uh, to help solve that problem in the interim. So I've been, I've been thinking about this project a lot. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about one of the earliest projects that I saw on the board, which was 228 Drive in Ave. And that was the townhouse one. It was all studios, it was on a hillside. And you know, they came in asking for area variances. And the crux of the argument, as I understood it, as I bought into, was that that building site was just a total pain to build on. You had a heavy slope and you had a lot of costs associated with bringing everything to grade and making it work. And I thought that if we did not provide the area variances and we said, hey, we got to build by the requirements of code, that they wouldn't have built that building because it would have been financially unfeasible. And I thought they made a good due diligence effort to bring the project as much into alignment with code as possible. And when I look at this project and I look at that formula there, it's essentially saying, hey, the code of 750 square feet per apartment doesn't make a lot of sense. And they're essentially proposing an alternative code, essentially. And when I think about that in terms of significance, they're not making any arguments. It's really based on the site at all. They're making an argument that, hey, across the board, across College Town, this just doesn't make sense. And this is an alternative framework for thinking about what you can build in R3A. And I think that is the definition of creating a precedence on this board that anyone in the R3A can make that exact same argument across the board. And I think it's very significant. I think it's very self-imposed. And I think they've demonstrated very clearly that they can build a building that aligns with code. And I sympathize with the economics of building a building that falls within code. But if we establish that precedence, every single person on the board saying, hey, give me that precedence. It's also hard to build three and four unit apartments. And there's nothing unique about this project that justifies it. So it's unique, self-created. I don't buy any of the neighborhood arguments that studios are better versus not. I mean, you know, there's plenty of anyone to come out of the woodwork and say, oh, you got a bunch of studios. They're just going to be a bunch of rambunctious undergrads. I mean, I don't buy any of those arguments. And, you know, if they came in here and said, oh, the site's a real pain. You know, we just did up in... College Town as well, where we had parking requirements for a corner lot, and we made them go back and add one more parking space because we saw on the map that they had the parking space requirement. You know, there's nothing stopping these developers from coming back later and saying, hey, we've got a lot of need for parking again. Cars got really cheap, everything's electric, let's bulldoze all these trees and put in parking spaces. I don't think that's realistic, but I think they're establishing code and establishing precedent, and that's what we've been doing. And I think that opens us up to a lot of problems down the road. Well, um, I guess the litigation to me is there's a whole lot of vacant spaces, a very, very, very short distance away from the church. And other R3A properties are not going to have that. They're not going to have 400 parking spaces. 
available. And even if it's not the exact same owner, that's the market demand. They're going to rent whoever owns that property is going to rent these spaces. So there's a lot of available parking. I mean, I, I'm less. I care a little less about the parking spaces argument. Like I struggle a bit with this because we don't really keep track of how many parking spaces we allocate to what. I mean, I wasn't a member of the board when we voted on Catherine Commons, but I have no idea how many parking spaces we essentially allocated to that. We don't keep track of it. We don't know. Uh, you know, I they've got a mitigation strategy. I have questions. You know, usually when I think of someone coming to our board and saying, "Hey, I want to put an accessory dwelling unit in my park, you know, place," I, I can do that by right, but I'm on a hillside and I can only put in one apartment, one parking space. So therefore, I looked around. I tried to find other parking in the area. I couldn't do it. Give me a variance, right? And this is we don't want to do it at all. And we've got a mitigation. I think what makes this unique on the parking front why I'm inclined to vote in favor of parking is because they have a genuine unique mitigation strategy. But, and I think that is unique, but on the R3, the apartments front, I think they're just creating a precedent here that's based on nothing unique in the parcel. Okay. That precedence isn't um, something that the PCA considers. That's what I'm taking. Um, I'll let Victor, but also this is, I'm sorry, this is the time for the board to deliver. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I would say, too, let, let me just say, she said if right. you need more numbers, you threw out some stuff just a minute ago about parking numbers and what you allocate to this or that. I believe we have those numbers here if you want them. You know, I, I think the parking is a secondary issue to me. It is the building question. I think we are not a precedent. I sort of started talking about 228 Dryden because I, my understanding of this board and how I approach this board is I think of the code and then I think about each parcel of property is a unique snowflake. And their approach to this is, hey, we have a parcel of land which we brought up no issues with. We've essentially said code is creating all of these problems for us. And I would say this is definitely not the only area in which code creates problems for developers. And these are huge, you know, from a percentage standpoint, these are obviously significant. And I am also thinking about significance in terms of, you know, we're not a precedence-based board, but this isn't an argument based on a unique characteristic of the parcel. This is an argument based on the code. And if we make the argument that code can be ignored here because the market incentives don't justify it according to these developers, they establishing that. It would be unfair to anyone in the future coming to the board. I take, I take issue with that. We very clearly say at the beginning of the board that there is no precedent set in any of the decisions made today. Um, so I, 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 can't, I can't understand the, the argument for setting precedent. Um, I guess I, I sort of understand this idea of changing the calculation, um, but I, I, I guess I, I side with the developer um, in a few ways that um, I believe when we're looking at the criteria that we need to discuss, I think that it also um, is helpful to, to understand how those criteria are being affected not only in a negative in a negative way, but in a positive way. So if we were to, to make the, the argument that um, uh, um, if there's an undesirable change produced in the character of the neighborhood detriment to our problems, we'd say no, we'd say, but it'd be better theoretically if they were to put in 17 units with with more people, increase the density, because that's what code allows. Well, then they'd have a, a code, a project that was that fit to code, wouldn't even have to be here anymore, but might actually make a bigger impact on the character of the neighborhood. Similarly, if we were to talk about parking in the physical environment conditions of the neighborhood, you say, oh, well, you, you could put in 34 spots, so why don't you do that? And then we don't have to talk about this at all. Now we end up with a worse project that has has not only worse environmental conditions for that neighborhood, but for the city and the county and the floodplain and for everybody else that lives downstream of it. So if we were to just think of these things in terms of 
of like, does it do this? Does it do that? Yes or no? I, I think we, we lose a lot of the, the space making and the, and the community building aspect of development projects in the city. And then we end up checking boxes and, and feeling okay about things and end up living in a place that isn't as enjoyable. I do want to just jump in real quick and clarify that that question about precedent. Um, you're not a strictly you know precedential based board in the same in the same way that like a court system is, but we do have an obligation to treat similarly situated projects similarly. Um, so to the extent that is helpful, that is a, a good thing to think about. To the extent that things are less similar, then you know there's less of a pressure. Um, I just wanted to throw that clarification in there. Um, Oh. Kirby or see Kirby and then scan. Yeah, I mean, I think we've gotten a bit in the left about I think this is a good project versus I think this is a bad project. Does it fit code? Does it not fit code? It's not our job to say, well, code, we disagree with the code, so and it's a good project, so you're in versus I don't like the paint that you're gonna put on that building, so it's a bad project, so you're out. Like we still have to say this is what code is. This is how you fit within it. I think Andre's points about how we're kind of just saying this is a different code. I mean, again, I don't think you need the parking, but it is what's required under code. If we think that somebody's not going to like come in here, if they don't do their diligence to come in and say, we well, just gave them 34 spots and we only need five, I think that's very short sighted for all of us here. And then, like, Marshall, you made the point on your own kind of that. You know, when looking at whether the alleged difficulty was self created, yes, they could do something else and lower the amount, but the answer is just let's do zero, right? Like this is this is entirely self created. There are feasible alternatives when we're looking at these. And then even going at whether an undesirable change would be produced, that's kind of hard for us to say. Like it's going from two or over two multiple dwelling houses with houses on either side or on the other side of it. Is another building better or is you know, those those residents that are there better. That's why, again, we're supposed to look at what's code, what's not code, why do they deserve to get these variances. If you look at parking, you guys have a really good opportunity with the extra parking spaces. Like no one's questioning that. Last time, I think it was brought up, the ability for that to travel with the property. So if you guys no longer own one or the other, and then that benefit is lost, what guarantees remain there? None, as far as I can tell. There's the hope that people just keep not bringing cars, but right now that's guesswork. So I think we're losing sight of what we're actually supposed to be doing. I, I, I don't uh, think that we're losing sight of it. Um, what you just highlighted is that you could take any of these and, and there is there is an argument for either side of them, on each of them, whether or not it's self-created or uh, whether or not there's a, a physical and environmental condition in the neighborhood that's being exacerbated or, or, or affected. And we have sort of laid out and talked about ways of how they're better or worse for each of them. So I, I, I don't think we're losing sight. Um, and I don't think that um, by bringing in other aspects of the project or potentials for other projects, um, is, is going too far uh, because because the idea of this is that um, while we will make arguments based on what's presented, uh, any any one of these points could be argued in either way, and we'll just need to keep on that. Mr. Gannon, did you want to? Um, I just think our, our role is to see if the mitigations make sense and override the code. And um, I, I don't know the science of all this, but I want to live next to uh, 23 studios rather than 15, three and four different years. I know that. I live downtown. Um, that's an easy call. Maybe there's no science to back it up, but I, uh, I think we have a better project. You know, I, we talked about this in the last meeting a little bit, but, you know, I think. The idea of a better project is a highly subjective question, right? And 
that's where I think the planning board's responsibility comes in. I think once we start having conversations about, hey, we don't agree with the code, we have this new framework for thinking about how people should build, because, uh, you know, that's essentially what they're doing. They're saying that we should be thinking about density in a different way, and we should be thinking about the interpretation of code in a different way. And then they're saying, hey, it's X, Y, Z, mitigation strategy. This is why it's good. This is why it's better not to comply with code. And you know that in and of itself is an argument that, again, opens the door to a lot of different frameworks for thinking about things where you can essentially get into a course trading conversation, which is like, hey, let me violate code here. I'm going to put some stuff on my building to make it greener. I'm going to put in solar panels that are above and beyond um, my carbon credits. It, it's an argument that's not based on the building at all. It's based on a subjective argument about how society should look. And therefore, it applies to everything that we look at going forward. You know, when we look at other projects, and let's say the code is 55% lot coverage, right? You know, we don't sit there and say, hey, they got to 60, that's good enough, right? If, you know, if the code is 60, you know, Common Council would make it 60 at the end of the day. And I get on some of this stuff that it's imperfect. We just saw a presentation that is imperfect, but those are narrow balanced things where you've got fire code involved or like the conversation about signage, right? We all can sit here and be like, oh, sign code doesn't make any sense for a 12-story building. But how many 12-story buildings are we gonna see? I, I think this is a precedence that applies to everything. It's significant, it's self-imposed. Yeah, I we can obviously go round and round in circles on this, but I don't I don't know what else to provide. Could you read into the record uh, what the planning board uh, thinks about that? Megan, you want to do that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I shared this last time, but I'm happy to read it again. Um, the lead agency finds that applicants' mitigations for the off street parking burdens, which include a large amount of parking available on the adjacent property, car share, transit accessibility, a private shuttle, and walkability to be substantial and do mitigate the need for on site parking. The lead agency also believes this is an appropriate location to achieve density and that the potential tenant populations of students are less likely to need and have cars. They find this is, one, this is in line with what the city wants to accomplish in College Town and nearby locations. The lead agency finds that due to the proposed use mix in the proposed apartment building, it is actually not as dense as it could be with fewer units in terms of headcount. Further, they support this variance as they support density in this location. They find no long-term effects to planning. I wanted to read that because if we're talking about the subjectivity of the code and the ability to, for an agency or a board to be able to do this, you just heard from the planning board saying that they like this project. They, I read, I hear that as a, we, the planning board that writes these codes that oversees the, the creation of our, our built environment, support this for the reasons that they've laid out. Agreeing with the density, something that just brought up, um, and being okay without the parking because of the mitigating factors that they have, that they have built into this project. So sure. I, I would tend to agree that we are not here to make value decisions on projects, but when we get such a strongly worded uh, letter of approval from the planning board, I think that it's a, um, a recognition on their own part that in a place where they are seeking density of this kind, the code may not be up to snuff. from our team and if it is possible for someone from our team to make a comment. It's up to the board again. It's their deliberation time. I'm fine, but why don't we just do a poll? Mike, you have any comments? You're all good? Yeah. All right, go for it. Um, so John Laney. Um, Hi. Can everyone hear me? So my name's John Lange. I'm, I'm a land use and zoning attorney here in Syracuse. Um, I'm not down there tonight and I apologize. Uh, my main job that I do is working for zoning and planning boards up here in central New York. Our office represents 
probably 30 different planning and zoning boards. So I have a nice opportunity on many occasions to see the, the variety of variances that you folks see all the time down there. So I, and I do teach on the subject. And the only thing I wanted to comment on here, and, and I think the comments from the board are very thoughtful. Uh, and I think in, in this instance, the one thing I would just ask the board to do as it deliberates is to remember that, that the outcome of this vote rest well well really it begins and it ends with that balancing test the balancing test that you as a zoning board are required to apply to any variance and remember that that balancing test asks the question of whether the benefit to the applicant which is which is us in this case outweighs any detriment to the neighborhood or, or area so what I would suggest is that the applicant here has certainly identified its benefit to get these variances. But what I haven't heard and, and uh, from the public or anyone else is what exactly is a detriment to the neighborhood if these variances are granted. And I, and I do understand because I mostly represent town, villages, uh, cities on occasion that, that there, there needs to be a respect for the zoning laws. However, the zoning board actually sits there to grant relief on these, on these uh, requests if the applicant has proven their case. And I would suggest strongly that the applicant here has certainly proven its case to, for these variances and they've offered a myriad of reasons, they've documented it. I would also argue that this case would absolutely not establish any kind of a precedence. The, the next applicant that would come in if we were granted this would have to show they have all of these exact same characteristics, all of the mitigations that have been identified, and they would have to show that they've actually proven their case, which in this instance we have. So I just would like the board to take a look at this from that 30,000 foot level and say, okay, we've heard all these things. Let's apply that balancing test. Did, did this applicant say that they, they are gonna receive a benefit from these variances? Clearly the answer is yes. And then the second question is, well, what exactly would the would the detriment be to this neighborhood or area? And I just don't think there's been any, but I also respect the board has to make its own decisions. And uh, and I simply would ask that you employ that part of your uh, uh, deliberation uh, to the outcome in this case. Thanks. I was wondering if the city attorney here can talk about the, man about the planning board versus the zoning board responsibility differences. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Assistant city attorney, sorry, give me, don't give me a promotion quite yet. Yeah, it's not one that I want. Um, yeah, and just to, to kind of piggyback off what John said, uh, he, he is correct, of course, that the overall test is a balancing test of you know benefit to the uh, property owner versus detriment to the community. Um, there are also the five factors that you're required to consider, uh, which you know you all know very well by now. Um, so I went and throw that in there into the, the things that you're explicitly required to consider. Um, it's sort of to the larger uh, distinctions between the planning board and the zoning board. Um, the planning board has a much more kind of freewheeling ability to consider uh, projects that would benefit the community. Uh, the function of the zoning board, of course, is to uh, consider whether an exception is warranted to the strict application of the zoning code uh, in a particular case. Um, I don't know the extent that which that's helpful for tonight's debate, um, and I, I, I'd be happy to uh, direct my comments further. No, I thought it just be useful to have that on the table. I think we've, for the most part, uh, skimmed by a lot of the planning board comments and gone directly to how does this specific unique project relate to code? And I think, I, I don't wanna say that my mind cannot be changed, but this project as is is not, I don't believe that it qualifies under the criteria. Uh, you know, as I said at the last meeting, I wish there was five people on this board and they could have five people vote on it, but that is my established opinion. You guys have anyone who'd like to do it? <laughs> Does anyone have much? I, I like John's summary of balancing out what is the detriment because what I'm, I'm hearing the word in some ways say is, well, what if, what if somebody up on uh, College Ave wants to build the same building? Um, we've, we're going to have to do the same thing. And what's the detriment? What is, if this were approved, what are the negative implications on that side? 
I think we have two frameworks to look at. We have what John talked about, which is, are they doing a mitigation framework? Are they creating detriment to the community by asking for these variances? And then we have the five factor criteria. Uh, you know, I think one is the variance substantial. The variance is substantial from a percentage basis based on the square footage for the lot area variance. It is the definition. It is substantial both in a raw dollar number, a raw square footage number and a percentage number. Uh, the same with parking, right? Uh, that's pretty clear there. Uh, is the alleged difficulty self-created? It is self-created. You know, and I, as I understand it through the training that we have received to think about this, our job is to think about the five criteria in balance with what just John just talked about, who at the end of the day is a representative of, you know, the developer bringing this case to the board. It's not, you know, a city staff member or anything like that. You know, I, I think this is any other project. If they came to the board and said, ah, this is the best we could do, we would turn it down in a heartbeat because we'd say, oh, you're, you're way over your square footage number. You're not even arguing that the lot is weird. You're way over your parking number. You're not even arguing it. I, I'm still thinking a little about the 34 off street parking number. I think if we voted on the lot area and we voted against it, I think that the project would be revised. And I think the off street parking thing would be a moot, but you know. No further comments. Anyone else has any other comments? If not, we are going to call for a motion. I think um, we would like to withdraw and um, consider our options. Uh, We see no, I see no, do we have to vote on that? Okay, I'll choose it Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're just going to take a moment um, before we move on to the rest of the agenda to um, switch out and David will come back and so for a brief pause. Okay. So just coming back to the agenda quickly, um, we have minutes that will be going out with your October meeting packet, but we don't have anything this evening. Um, for minutes wise, the October packet, because there's no rest, will be going out tomorrow morning because we meet again next Tuesday. We have three appeals on that agenda, um, two new area variances and the continuation of the sign appeal for the Ithacan at um, 215 East State and 210 East Green Street. So the two parcels that it's one project. Um, so that'll be coming. What are, what are the area variances? Can you just give me an address or something? Um, the area variances? Yep, one moment. Okay, so coming up next week will be 706 Lynn Street and 108 to 110 Edge Street. What's the name of the one that I need? Um, it's 108 to 110 is uh, it's the, the Gray Court building um, on the corner of. Oh, okay. Eddie and Stady. So it'll be right there. It's a parking variance. Um, 706 Lynn Street is a lot area deficiency in its signs. So, um, okay, so those are coming up for next week. Everyone's going to be there? Yep. Sorry, it's next week. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Tuesday, I'm in Wilson. Oh, it should already be on the calendar. <laughs> same, same um, time, same, same bag. Oh, it's October. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's unusual. So is it here? It will be here at six o'clock, which is an excellent segue. Um, a while ago, when we thought we were returning to in person meetings, we talked about shifting the time a little bit because I know several people got out of work and such, and you had to kill an hour. And we talked about maybe starting at 5 30 or, or an earlier time so that. Um, we also got home earlier. What are people's thoughts on that? It won't be for October. It would be starting in November because I already had to advertise the October public hearings. So. so we're starting at six. Six on October fourth, but in the future, what time would work best for people? I can do five thirty. I can do five thirty. I can do five thirty. The what does staff prefer? What do you guys? I mean, not that we don't love staying here late at night, yeah. but the earlier we start is also more enjoyable for us too. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, tonight's was a reasonable night meeting. I mean, it's good for to, a while there we were. Yeah. Um, yes. So I just, I'm trying to keep it to four appeals, but sometimes it doesn't happen. So. Um, okay. So I think that's everything on our agenda. So. Okay. We can officially adjourn. Meeting is adjourned. Oh, we have to no. motion that. Do you? Do you? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.